Welcome to my talk. Uh, today I'm going to be sharing a little bit of research that I've been doing recently um, on 3D seismic uh, morphology of large incised channels uh, in the Gippsland Basin that formed in the Cenozoic. Uh, so this work forms part of my PhD thesis, uh, which I submitted last year. Uh, and also I wanted to acknowledge that I'm a recipient of the Gelsop Vic postgrad research grant that I received in 2019. Um, so I'm very appreciative of receiving that grant and it has gone toward completing a lot of this research. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with the Gibson Basin, but just in case anyone is not, uh, the Gibson Basin is located on the southeastern corner of the Australian continent. So it formed as part of a long line of rift basins along the southern margin of Australia. And they formed with uh, the breakup of Gondwana when Australia rifted off Antarctica during the Mesozoic. The Gibson Basin has a really long running history of industry interest. Uh, so uh, in around the 1800s, very thick coal seams were discovered on shore. And those brown coal seams are some of the thickest in the world. They're over a hundred meters thick. Uh, and then during the 20th century, some large hydrocarbon fields were discovered offshore. Um, so those hydrocarbon fields have been um, kind of produced from during the duration of the 20th century. Uh, and as a result of that long running industry interest, there's a huge amount of data available uh, in the Gibson Basin. So there's many, many wells, both onshore and offshore. Um, there's quite a, quite a bit of 2D seismic, um, which is also both onshore and offshore. And then offshore, there's many 3D seismic volumes. So a subset of those 3D seismic volumes um, were merged to form what's called the mega cube. <laughs> Um, so it's a large merged 3D seismic volume, and it covers basically most of the offshore Gippsland Basin. Um, so we accessed that 3D seismic volume through the Geological Survey of Victoria. So for my PhD, I interpreted right across the Gippsland Basin um, from the offshore to the onshore um, and did quite a bit of seismic and well interpretation over that area. So the work I'm gonna show you today um, focuses on the, the central deep and northern margin of the Gippsland Basin, but it builds on work that we've undertaken across the whole basin, both onshore and offshore. So for this work, we've used the 3D seismic megacube um, and the 3D seismic volador volume, uh, and then a subset of 23 key wells. The stratigraphy of the Gippsland Basin can basically be divided into three broad groups, the Strzelecki, the Latrobe and the Sea Spray groups. So we're interested in the Latrobe group today. Uh, and the Latrobe group consists of stacked coastal plain and shore face deposits. So from the late Cretaceous to the roughly the end Eocene, the Latrobe group was strongly transgressive. So it backstepped across the basin. Um, and in front of these shore face, backstepping shore face deposits, the flooded marine shelf was quite sediment starved. So there was not much sedimentation going on in that marine environment. Uh, and then overlying the Latrobe group um, is the sea spray group, which offshore it consists of um, cool water, deep marine carbonates. So in addition to these backstepping shore face deposits in the Latrobe group, we have these huge incised channels. So they're, they're over 500 metres of incision. Um, so they're quite significant features. So we have the tuna channel um, and we also have the marlin. So the tuna and the marlin. So the tuna channel is filled with flounder formation sediments. Um, and then the marlin is filled in with turum formation sediments. So the kind of understanding um, from the literature is that these large incised channels are thought to be associated with regional tectonic uplift. Um, the timing of which is a little, has historically been a little bit vague in the literature. Um, it was generally attributed to the mid to early, early to mid Eocene. Um, so it was thought that there was regional uplift in the early to mid Eocene. Um, these large channels formed with fluvial incision 
Um, and there's often a regional erosive unconformity um, interpreted to be associated with that. And then um, with kind of increased um, subsiding of the basin, um, transgression reinitiated and filled in these channels with estuarine to marine transgressive sediments. However, um, some recent research uh, that I did as part of my PhD showed that structures in the Gippsland Basin remained extensional until the late Eocene. So we have lots and lots of normal faults across the basin um, and they all show extens extensional growth um, up to the late Eocene. And then those lovely big anticlines that we have in the Latrobe group, which track our hydrocarbons, none of those show um, initiation or growth uh, until the Eocene Oligocene transition. So we don't really have any evidence for compressional uplift prior to the Oligocene. So if these large incised channels um, are not associated with that tectonic uplift, then basically how the heck do they form? <laughs> Um, so we kind of wanted to investigate that a little bit. Uh, so we did a lot of seismic interpretation uh, and that seismic interpretation was both onshore and offshore. Um, I'm showing you the offshore work here. Uh, so this is in the 3D seismic mega cube. Um, and we've interpreted down to the T9, which is late Cretaceous in age. Um, and what we found when we were interpreting this seismic data was that we could um, quite easily delineate these packages and they're amalgamated coastal plain and shore face packages. So each of these um, packages or units is composed of um, our coastal plain sediments, there's quite a bit of coal, and then these lovely shore faces which when we ran seismic extractions, amplitude extractions on, they showed um, really clearly strand lines or beach ridge plains which we can we associate with paleo shorelines. So each of these units is uh, differentiated from the overlying one by commonly a, a downlap surface um, and a, a back step of the shoreline, the paleo shoreline that we can see from those strand lines. So we kind of wanted to work out, work out how do these big incised channels fit in this stratigraphic framework? Uh, so this is a seismic line through the basin um, and this is showing the incised channels. So on the left we have the Marlin channel and then on the right we have the tuna channel. So you'll see that the tuna channel has been divided into tuna channel one and tuna channel two. Um, so when we looked at the ages of the fill of these channels we found a really clear difference in age um, between tuna channel one and two. So based on the difference in age of the sedimentary fill of these channels, and also on this cross-cutting relationship that you can see here, we divided up the tuna channel into one and two. But basically these are kind of broad divisions because each of these three channels all um, consist of multiple phases of incision and infilling. So they're quite complicated. So this seismic line um, is located here. Um, and this surface is basically, um, so it's called a dip angle map. So what it's showing is um, the degree of dip on the base of those channels. So I've basically stitched together the base of the three channels um, to give an amalgamated map of all three. So you get a really nice idea of the outline of these channels. And the goal of this was to measure our maximum aerial extent of these erosive features. So using this um, dip angle map and seismic intersections through, we were able to map um, the maximum uh, aerial extent and also get really lovely details about um, the way these channels are formed. So you can see some really nice meanders um, and quite a bit of detail in the base of those channels. So we're gonna look at a bit of seismic now. Um, so this is tuna channel one. So this is our oldest of the three channels. Um, this formed during the early Eocene. Uh, and you can see we have these really nice, steeply dipping erosive walls to the channel. And that's terminating the parallel reflectors of the older Latrobe group sediments. The sedimentary fill of the channel appears to be of a lower seismic amplitude. It's a little bit duller. 
and it also appears a little chaotic in character. It doesn't have those nice planar layers that the rest of the Latrobe group does. Uh, and then when, if we look at tuna channel two, um, so this is the slightly younger, this is mid Eocene. Again, we see those nice erosive um, channel walls terminating the parallel reflectors of the Latrobe group. And the channel fill is again of a lower seismic amplitude and a little bit chaotic. Um, and then, so this is at the, the channel head. So it, we're at the head of tuna channel one. We step down a little bit down the channel. And we again see nice steeply dipping erosive channel walls that have cut into those older Latrobe group sediments. Their flounder formation fill is a lower amplitude, um, a little bit chaotic, but we're seeing um, hints of a slightly more a cohesive behavior of the channels. So a little bit of lateral migration and reflecting the multiple incision and infilling events. So we looked at well logs through the flounder formation in both these channels, tuna channel one and two. Um, and this is what we found. So this basal yellow one here, this is tuna channel one, which is the older of the channels. Um, and we see the gamma ray response is consistently fairly high. So it tends to be fairly silty, muddy. We have some, a couple of minor interbeds of sandstone. And when we looked at the industry reports for these wells, um, they reported carbonate, carbonaceous detritus, diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates, agglutinate foraminifera, uh, and gluconitic siltstone throughout the flounder formation. Then if we look at the flounder wells in tuna channel two, again, we see a, a relatively high gamma ray response. Uh, the flounder formation in this channel tends to be a little bit sandier. Um, so we do see more of a serrate lob character. But again, well completion reports recorded dinoflagellates, agglutinate foraminifera, planktonic foraminifera, and carbonaceous material all throughout these sediments. Um, but we also wanted to look at core. So you need to relate your seismic data to core. Um, so we looked at some through the well Flounder 2. Um, so Flounder 2 is in Tuna Channel 2, the younger of the two, that's mid Eocene. Um, and we found um, what we saw was uh, consistent with our log data. So fairly silty and muddy. Um, we unfortunately didn't have core through this nice sand bed in the middle, um, but we had core in the upper and lower. Um, and we see things like ripples, planar bedding, um, lots of biturbation, and the sandy bed that we did get some core through um, is quite coarse and poorly sorted. Um, so now we're gonna move to the Marlin Channel. This is the youngest of the three, and this is mid to late Eocene in age. Uh, so this is a seismic line through the head of the Marlin Channel. Uh, and we see this really nice, broad erosive character. But one of the kind of key features with the Marlin Channel, which is kind of curious, is we see this significantly underfilled character. So the Marlin Channel is filled only maybe a quarter of the depth of incision. Um, so when the Turin formation stopped depositing, um, the rest of the canyon has been, been, has been passively infilled with carbonate sediments, deep marine carbonate sediments of the sea spray group. Um, but again, similar to the, the tuna channels, we see these erosive walls and a slightly lower amplitude seismic response. So if we step down the channel a bit, um, this is a, a line across one of those meanders and we see erosive walls again, lower amplitude, kind of chaotic seismic fill. But as evidence of um, multiple events, multiple incision, incision and infilling events. So we'll have a look at some well logs. Um, so these are the well logs through the Tarim formation in the Marlin Canyon. Um, and we see a, a little bit more of a variable response in our well logs, um, but again, still quite high gamma ray um, and that serrate sandy log character. In addition, uh, well, report, well completion reports have reported calcareous claystone and siltstone uh, in some instances, they said there was up to 40% glauconite um, and a very large abundance and diversity of dinoflagellates, uh, foraminifera, 
and they also reported echinoderm spines and brachiopod fossils. So we looked at some core through the well race one, um, which is located here. Um, and unsurprisingly, it looked pretty glauconitic, it's quite green, um, no, no, no um, particularly nice bedding. It's a little bit kind of um, jumbled up and fossils, marine macro fossils were quite clearly evident, um, such as brachiopods. So we have our um, kind of backstepping coastal plain units. We have these nice incised channels and we need to try and reconcile that. So one thing we did have as well was biostratigraphic data for all of these coastal units and for these channels and channel fill. So we decided to have a look at how the timing would relate. In addition to the biostratigraphic um, information, we also have the location of our paleo shorelines. So using that seismic data, showing those really nice strand lines, um, we decided to compare where these channels would sit um, relative to the coeval paleo shorelines that were forming at that time. Um, and this is essentially what we found. So if we start with the oldest channel, Tuna Channel 1, um, when Tuna Channel 1 was forming, um, at the same time, the T5 and T4 paleo shorelines were forming. So we can see that Tuna Channel 1 is located quite a bit seaward of these paleo shorelines. However, the caveat for Tuna Channel 1 is that we have not preserved the channel head. So it's been um, eroded away. It's been incised into by Tuna Channel 2. Fortunately, we do have the head of Tuna Channel 2. Um, and when it was forming, the T4 to T2 paleo shorelines were forming. So we can see clearly that the Tuna Channel 2 is located seaward of these three paleo shorelines. And then if we move to um, the final one, the Marlin Channel. Um, when the Marlin Channel was incising, the T4 to T0 paleo shorelines were backstepping. So one of the features of these channels is that they are located at or seaward of their coeval paleo shorelines. Um, and often with a channel incision, we don't just erode downstream, we also erode via headward erosion. Um, so it's quite possible that when these channels initiated, they were not located um, as far onshore as they currently appear. So we're starting to build a picture now where we're starting to get a hint that maybe these channels and their channel fill are not actually fluvial. Perhaps they might be submarine. Um, however, they are located very close to the paleo shorelines um, in quite shallow water. So we had a look, bit of a look around the world um, for some modern analogues. And we found quite a few modern shelf incising submarine canyons. So submarine canyons don't necessarily have to form on the slope. Um, they can form on the shelf and in fact, in quite shallow water. So for example, the Delgada Canyon of California, um, the head is located only a hundred meters from the, from the present day shoreline and in nine meters of water. Similarly, the Garucha, Cabrera and Elias canyons um, are located in 100 to 500 metres of water and only around 7 to 17 metres um, of water depth. And then the Monterey Canyon um, is located incredibly close to shore and in only 10 metres of water. So we have some analogues um, and we're starting to think that perhaps these channels are quite likely to be submarine shelf incising channels as opposed to um, fluvial canyons. Um, so if we run through what we found, um, we saw this large depth of incision um, and multiple incision events. So that seems quite consistent um, with submarine um, depositional environments. So submarine canyons can incise, incise um, quite deep and they don't require regional unconformity. Um, so we don't need to invoke any regional uplift to account for that large amount of incision. In addition, the channel fill, the formation sediments consist of quite a bit of marine indicators. There's marine macro fossils, there's micro fossils, there's glauconite, there's calcareous sediments. So our, our channel fill sediment um, is looking quite marine. 
And then if we look at the timing, the timing of these channels um, is that they're located seaward of their coeval paleo shorelines, um, which seems quite significant. It's a little bit hard to invoke terrestrial uplift or terrestrial formations if they're located seaward. Um, and, and in that case, we don't really need our compressional tectonics because these canyons, they predate that um, tectonic onset. Um, so basically we're reinterpreting these lovely big incised features as likely forming via submarine processes. Thank you.